Hello. Okay. Oh, it's really loud. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so today we're fortunate to have Josh Tobin here, who, after getting his PhD from UC Berkeley and working as a research scientist at OpenAI, is now the CEO and co-founder of Gantry. He will tell us about evaluating your LLMs for your applications. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I'm excited to be here. Um, unfortunately, I have not been lucky enough to attend um, much of the conference so far up to this point, but I've heard uh, a rumor that it's been all about hype around LLMs. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So how many, how many are like buying into the hype at this point? That was a good chunk. And how many are still skeptical? Okay. Um, also a healthy chunk. So I'm here to tell you that um, your opinion on LLMs doesn't matter. What matters is your users' opinions of LLMs. And users are like increasingly starting to demand that these features become part of the products that they interact with. So a great example of this is Stack Overflow. Um, you know, I'm a, uh, I used to write code every day. I still write code sometimes. I use Stack Overflow all the time, as do I think most technical folks. But um, Stack Overflow is really hurting right now. Um, their, their traffic is down 14% in March. It's not because Stack Overflow has become a worse product. It's because the, the people that interact with Stack Overflow are now demanding this new way of interacting with knowledge that they find on the internet. And you know, because of that, and also because it's been getting easier and easier to build these applications, everyone, it seems like, is announcing something. This is just, you know, at Gantry, we keep a list of all the companies that we've seen make announcements about LLM-powered products, and we ha that list has like more than 100 companies on it, and I'm not even convinced that that's anywhere near comprehensive. Um, and so one of the reasons why this is happening is because of the demand, but the other reason why is because it's never been easier to get started building machine learning powered applications than it is with um, these LLM APIs, right? So I've um, been working in deep learning for a long time. I have never seen um, a deep learning project take less than like six to nine months from conception to launch. There's just too much stuff that you have to build. But a lot of the companies on the list before this, they're building and launching these products in like three weeks. Right, so it's never been easier to get started, right? If you, you might have this idea, like, I would love to build an app that allows my, um, my customers to ask questions about their Notion database. And you'll go on Google, you'll Google around a little bit, or you'll ask ChatGPT maybe, and you'll quickly find out there's a Langchain template for that, right? So 15 minutes in, you've already got um, MVP of your product. And I think many of us get the wrong idea when we, when we have this experience, which is that, okay, the, the MVP was really easy to build, so that means that everything else will be easy to build too. And so what we have in our heads is a picture like this, right? We, gotta, we start with a Langchain demo, um, and then we do some stuff, right? We do some other things. And then eventually, like, after a few more steps, um, then we're going to have this amazing product that's powered by ML. Maybe it'll even be AGI, right? Um, and so unfortunately, um, if any of you are actually building products that are powered by these technologies, you'll know that this step in the middle is a lot messier and harder to navigate than it might seem at first glance. So language models are these incredibly powerful primitives, but you know, I, um, when I started to get deeper and deeper into this part of the field, I heard this term prompt engineering. And so I was imagining this like burgeoning engineering discipline, right, with all this rigor and careful thought and um, measurement and planning. But, you know, I think it's safe to say that it's a little bit generous to call, uh, to call this prompt engineering. Maybe we should call it, you know, prompt hacking or something like that. And when you actually build your LLM application, it's really difficult to know whether this thing is actually working or whether it just worked on the handful of examples you tried it with. Um, and you might be asking yourself, as, you know, as an engineer, maybe, um, is it even possible to test these things? So the upshot is there's always been an ML, and even more so now, there's a big gap between, um, between, hmm, it's not showing up, weird, uh, between building demos and building reliable production systems. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to sort of do, do a deep dive on this question of how can we actually know whether the applications that we're building with language models are really working? So we're going to talk about evaluation of LLM-powered applications. Um, and so uh, I, I think I prepared too many slides here, so I'm going to go through as much of this as I can, but um, you know, happy to also share these slides, or folks should just feel free to reach out to me if you want to um, talk more about these things, because this is a really deep and interesting topic in the LLM world right now. All right, first thing we'll talk about is you know, why evaluation? Like, why is this even worth talking about? So at the end of the day, I think evaluation is really about trust. There's two parties that need to trust the model that's being built. The first is you, like your company, your team. Um, you need to know whether changes that you made as a developer are actually good or not, so that you know whether to spend more of your team's time to validate them further. 
as an organization, you need to understand, is it risky to deploy this model? Like, can we trust this in front of our users, or is this gonna be bad for our brand or bad for our product? And let's face it, these models are expensive. So we also have to be able to tell whether the changes that we're making or the applications that we're building actually justify the cost that um, we're paying to run them. But trust is also really important for your end users. Um, so as an end user of an LLM-powered product, um, I, you know, if I need to constantly check the answers that are being output by the system, or if I get you know, one level of performance one day and another level of performance another day, it's really difficult for me to trust the system and to rely on it. And so to come back to this example of Stack Overflow and ChatGPT, um, you know, I've found myself more and more going back to Stack Overflow um, to, because you know, I've just had enough times when uh, ChatGPT spit out something that was incorrect that um, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel worth it to just check every single answer that I get from, from an application like that. Um, so I would hypothesize that we're kind of, um, you know, if you talk to the folks that are building these product features powered by LLMs, what you'll hear from a lot of them is that they're seeing incredible um, user engagement and retention with these features. Like, in some cases, unprecedented. Um, you know, we've never launched a feature that had more than 1% lift in our metrics, and our LLM feature had a 7% lift in our metrics. But I would hypothesize that there's a coming wave of churn for LLM-powered um, product features. And you know, there's two reasons for this. The first is just because you know, a lot of the engagement right now is because this is a shiny object and users are excited about it. But the second is because um, trust is like a, a, a long tail lagging indicator. Um, it's something that your user, you um, might have with your users initially, but you'll erode over time if, um, if they can't actually rely on the results that your, your model is producing. That brings us to evaluation. The key question with evaluation is, how do we measure the performance of a new model or a new prompt? And why does this matter? Well, um, things are constantly changing. Model vendors are updating their base models all the time. Um, those updates, you know, they'll claim that, they're, that the base models are better, and you know, on average they are, but they might not be better for your task. Um, LLMs make tons of mistakes, and just because the new prompt that you developed works better on the handful of examples that you tried it on does not mean that it's actually better in general for all of the things that your end users care about. So it's super, super common to have an experience like this where you um, change your prompt or you change your base model and it improves things in a lot of ways, but it also makes things worse in a lot of ways. So how do we deal with this kind of phenomenon? You might ask, like, what kinds of mistakes do LLMs make? Um, some common ones include hallucination, right? so confidently saying something that is not correct. Uh, sometimes they get the formatting wrong of the outputs, which can be hard to build downstream systems on top of. They might have the wrong tone. They might have a tone that um, you, know, you don't really want your brand to have. Um, they can easily be, pro be provoked, although it's getting harder and harder to go off the rails and you know, turn, your, uh, turn your big moment as a company into a Sydney moment. Um, you don't want that. But on the flip side, they can also often be overly cautious. Right? Um, there's a, this phenomenon of like RLHF responses, which is you know, uh, capturing this idea that sometimes when you ask ChatGPT a perfectly innocent question, it says, I'm just a language model. I don't want to touch that one with a 10-foot pole. Um, and that can, that can be bad for your users as well. Um, and there's all kinds of other sort of failures that these systems have, like repetitiveness. So how does evaluation help with this? Um, well, evaluation really provides you three things. So the first thing is validation. It's validation that the model that you're developing avoids some of the common failure modes. And these are the ger general failure modes that we showed on the last slide, as well as the specific failure modes that you've seen for the particular application that you're developing. Evaluation also is more than just validation. It also provides a common language um, for your team. Um, one of the things that you know, has always really slowed machine learning projects down in industry is, um, hey, you know, the ML team is convinced that they have a model that's really good, but the rest of the organization isn't. And this phenomenon is continuing to play out in the LLM world. And in fact, in some cases, it's just even higher stakes. So if you have a, really, if you have a robust validation suite, um, evaluation suite that your team has agreed on and can trust, it can help you make faster decisions about whether to ship something. And then lastly, evaluation. You know, your model is not gonna score perfectly on your evaluation if you set it up the right way. Uh, and so evaluation can also give you a roadmap for how to prioritize additional improvements to the model. So that's why we care about evaluation. Um, next, I wanna talk about what are the characteristics of a good evaluation. So a good evaluation needs to be, first and foremost, it needs to be correlated with the outcomes that you're actually trying to drive with your application. So if your evaluation has nothing to do with what your users care about, it's not a good evaluation. Ideally, um, a, a great evaluation will also be fast and automatic, like something that you can just run as part of your development workflow to make sort of faster decisions about whether the changes you're making are working. And part of that 
being successful is, you know, ideally having a single metric that you can look at at any given time to, to make those decisions quickly. Um, so that's, that's some of the characteristics that you might look for in a good evaluation. Um, next thing I want to talk about is why is this hard, right? Machine learning has been around for a long time. We've had to evaluate machine learning models the entire time that we've had it. So why is this a particularly interesting topic and top of mind thing now? Um, so to answer that, I'm going to first talk about the old school way of testing machine learning models. You know, back in the day, uh, 12 months ago, we had this technology called deep learning, right? And in deep learning, um, we had this crazy idea that you'd have to gather data and train a model um, before you could actually use that model to solve tasks. And so in traditional machine learning, um, you always start with a training distribution. And from that training distribution, you sample a set of data, and that data is used to train your model. You compute a metric, like let's say accuracy on that training data. Um, and then you sample some other data from that same distribution and compute the same set of metrics. This is your evaluation set. The difference between your accuracy or your metric on your evaluation set and on your training set is a measure of overfitting. So how much is the model like overly specific to the specific data points it's trained on? Then when you deploy your model, you get this other distribution of data that's potentially different from what you train on. This is your production distribution. So you'll sample some data from this to form a test set. And the, di the difference in performance between your evaluation set and your test set is a measure of like how much the domains are shifting between training and, uh, and testing. And then finally, um, on an ongoing basis, you'll continue to sample data from production and compute your same metrics. Um, and the difference between, you know, what was your initial test data and what's your test data now, that's a measure of drift. So like how much performance is degrading as a result of data changing over time. Um, so this is like the, the old school way as of 12 months ago to evaluate machine learning systems. Um, why doesn't this work in the LLM world? Well, a few reasons. First of all, um, you don't actually have access to the data that your model was trained on, um, assuming that you're using an API from OpenAI or, or a company like that. Um, and even if you are using a, an open source model, um, you're probably, you know, you might have access to the data it was trained on, but it's so much data that you probably don't actually understand what's in it. Um, also, since we're using pre-trained models, the production distribution, the distribution of the task that you actually care about is, no matter what, always going to be different than the distribution your model was trained on. So some of the assumptions that are fundamental to traditional machine learning don't really apply directly here. Um, furthermore, like the metrics, this idea of just computing accuracy doesn't really work super well either. Um, so in traditional ML, let's say that you are classifying whether an image is a picture of a cat or a dog. You can just look at the correct versus incorrect predictions and compute a measure of something like accuracy. But in generative ML, oftentimes we're not um, doing something where there's a straightforward answer, right? So if instead we're generating a sentence that describes the image, how do we measure whether um, the sentence on the top or the sentence on the bottom is a better um, answer to the question of what's in this image? So what metric should we use? And it's really hard to define this quantitatively. Another reason why LLMs um, are different than traditional ML is that more so than in traditional ML, oftentimes we expect our LLM-powered applications to work on a really wide variety of different tasks. So if we have an accuracy that's 90%, that might be really good or really bad depending on whether you care about uh, more about the answers to questions about startups or questions about physics, where this model is not doing particularly well. Um, and so it could be really hard to summarize performance on a diverse set of inputs and tasks with a single number. So to summarize, your model is trained on the internet. That means that um, you always have drift, and drift doesn't matter. Um, oftentimes, the outputs of your model are, qu are qualitative, so it's hard to automatically measure success. And you care about a diversity of behaviors, so aggregate metrics don't work. So what are we supposed to do? Like, what's the answer? Um, for the rest of the talk, what we'll cover is sort of a recipe for evaluating LLM-powered applications. And there's two main components to this. First, you need to pick what data you're going to evaluate on. And then you need to pick the metrics that you're going to use to do the evaluation. And the upshot is that the better your data and the better your metrics, the better your evaluations. Um, so high, very high level, there's sort of four different approaches to um, evaluating language model applications that people are using today. Um, there's public benchmarks which is, you know, you go online and you, like, look at a benchmark that says, is uh, this open source model better than GPT 3.5? There's user testing, where you um, see how your users interact with a small number of inputs. Um, there's automatic evaluation, where you use other language models or other heuristics to evaluate the performance of the model. And then there's um, rigorous human-based evaluation. And these all have different trade-offs in terms of how expensive they are to run and how, um, how reliable the result that you'll get will be. Um, so I want to talk really quickly about public benchmarks. I put them down kind of in the bottom left, which, you know, on a two-by-two, two, the bottom left's bad. 
So why am, I, why, am I, uh, why am I so against public benchmarks? Well, I'm not against public benchmarks, but I think they're fundamentally flawed if your goal is to build applications powered by this technology, not to build language models yourself. Um, so to see why, like, let's talk about some of the different types of publicly available benchmarks. Um, so there's publicly available benchmarks that cover what I would call like functional correctness, like um, is the output of this model um, actually solving the task that we want it to solve? So oftentimes this is around like code completion and things like that. Um, these benchmarks are actually really good if you care about that task, because they measure the downstream performance of the, the model. Um, another type of benchmark that you might see is sort of live human evaluation benchmarks. Um, there's a popular one right now called Chatbot Arena, where you, uh, they're basically two chatbots go do battle with each other, and people can log in and um, send prompts to each of them and pick which one they like more. So you might, um, this is human evaluation, so you might be tempted to think that these are actually the best, but they are actually um, very, I find them useful, but they're actually quite flawed. Uh, another sort of category of benchmarks you might see is benchmarks where we have models evaluate other models. Um, this is a category that's growing really rapidly in popularity right now. Um, it's very general, and I think it's super promising, but um, you have to be very careful about how you interpret the results of a language model evaluating um, itself or another language model. Then there's these like massive benchmarks that you've probably seen, like Helm, um, Big Bench, that cover a wide range of different tasks. Um, and so they're super holistic, and they give us the temptation of thinking this is like the, um, the end-all, be-all of model performance. But the challenge with these benchmarks is that they don't include your task. Um, they don't include the task that you care about. And then finally, there's you know, the old school way of evaluating language models, which is to use um, some of these sort of uh, heuristic metrics like blue. Um, and these have kind of fallen out of favor recently because a bunch of research has shown that they have all kinds of biases that are hard to get around. So I mentioned the chatbot arena. Um, personally, of all the publicly available benchmarks, this is the one I find myself referring to the most um, because it is most correlated in my subjective experience with how, what it feels like to interact with these models. But you know, benchmarks, like publicly available benchmarks in general, are never gonna answer the question for you of which model is best for your task because they don't measure performance on your task. And they don't take into account the details of your setup, like how you do prompting, um, how you do in-context learning, whether you're fine-tuning, and things like that. Um, and they also have all of the same issues that we'll talk more about throughout the rest of this talk. So if you're serious about building applications on top of language models, you need to be building your own evaluation set for the tasks that you care about. So how do you do that? Uh, the way to think about high-quality evaluation sets is you can think of them as being like high coverage. What does that mean? Informally, it means that most of the data that you see in production, so most of the things that your users are trying to do, look like some of the data that you have in your evaluation set. Um, so this, this is kind of an informal notion that I think can and should be formalized. I think there's, um, there's potentially some good ways of doing this. But uh, practically speaking, there's a recipe that you can follow to build an evaluation set for your task um, in a way that's practical and doesn't require you to do all the work up front. And uh, so we're gonna start out incrementally. Um, and so what does this mean? It means that as we're developing our application, we'll be doing evaluations ad hoc as we go as part of the development process. So let's say that I'm trying to build um, an LLM-powered feature where my users can submit subjects and we write short stories about those subjects. As I'm prototyping this prompt, what I'll do is I'll try the prompt out on a few different subjects, like dogs, hats, LinkedIn. Um, and as I find interesting examples, um, I will add them to a data set so that I, rather than needing to make up my examples every single time when I make a change to my prompt, I'll just be able to run the, the new prompt against all of those examples that I've run it on in the past. What are interesting examples? Interesting examples are examples that are either hard for this model or this prompt. So um, I found an example where my prompt didn't do the right thing, or they're examples that I thought of that are really different than anything else that I thought of before. And so it's worth having some coverage of those examples in my evaluation set. Okay, so you're starting incrementally, you're building up a handful of examples that are just things that you wanna use to validate changes to your prompt. The next thing you can do is you can use your language model to help. Um, language models are surprisingly good at generating um, example data to further validate the performance of your model. Um, there's some open source tools that can help with this. One is called Auto Evaluator, um, which is focusing on this in the, con in the um, context of document question answering. And uh, we at Gantry have some tools that help with this in our product as well. Um, but you can just write a, you know, you can also do this on your own by writing a prompt that just describes the type of data you want 
And um, you know, especially if you use a model like GPT-4, it's going to probably be pretty good at generating interesting data for you to evaluate your model on. So lastly, as you start to roll this application out, um, first to you know, your friends or your close colleagues, then maybe to your broader team, your compliance team, your legal department, um, and then eventually to a subset of your users, your alpha users, and then eventually to all of your users. As you progressively roll this application out, you'll keep adding data as you go. What data should you add to your evaluation data? Well, um, easy heuristics include like what examples do your users dislike. Hopefully you're collecting feedback from your users about what they like and dislike. Uh, you could also have an annotator in the loop to answer that question for you. Um, you can, again, use a model in the loop to answer that question. Um, or you can um, you know, follow the heuristic instead of looking for data that's different than what you have now. And regardless of whether your users liked the answer or didn't like the answer, you could add examples that are very different than your current evaluation set. Or, um, for example, like cover topics that are underrepresented in your evaluation set now. So as you roll out your model to more and more users, you're collecting examples of places where users did something you didn't expect or the model did something your users didn't expect and you're adding those to your evaluation set so you, over time, have a broader and broader set of examples to test your model on um, as you make changes. So now you have an evaluation set, and the next question we need to answer is, okay, what, how do we actually measure whether the model's doing the right thing on this evaluation data? The way to think about the quality of evaluation metrics is you want them to be reliable. Um, so informally, that means the metrics that you're computing offline on this evaluation data should be predictive of the outcomes that you care about in the real world. Um, you could break this like, sort of property out into subcomponents. I'm not sure these are the right words to describe it, but you know, the first subcomponent is like, um, you have all these proxy metrics that you're measuring. If you measure those proxy metrics correctly, do those, like, are those predictive of the things that your users really care about? Are they predictive of your user, like the quality from the perspective of your users? And then the second question is accuracy, right? So, um, among those heuristics, you might ask something like, uh, is the result factually accurate? Well, um, factual accuracy might be predictive of outcomes for your users, but if you can't um, measure factual accuracy in a reliable way, it's still going to be really difficult to use this as an automated evaluation set. Um, in the research literature, there's tons of examples of different ways that people can, uh, like different types of evaluation metrics that people have developed. And so this is kind of like a like high-level flowchart that you can follow. To, um, to pick evaluation metrics for your model. And it's gonna depend on answers to questions like, is there a correct answer? If there's a correct answer, then all this is a lot easier because we can use the same evaluation metrics we used in traditional ML. If there's no correct answer, um, then any other sort of data that we have about what are good and bad answers will still be helpful. So a reference answer, even if it's not the only correct answer or even the best answer, will still help um, you evaluate the results more reliably. and um, uh, and then also just any sort of feedback that you have from people on previous answers that can also be input into your, into your evaluation system. And, um, the, uh, and so the, the kind of like the trick here, the, what's behind all of these different techniques is the idea of using language models to evaluate other language models. Um, so that sounds like kind of a crazy idea, right? Like how do we, if we don't trust these language models, why do we trust them to evaluate other language models? Um, it is kind of a crazy idea, but it turns out that empirically, it works pretty well for a lot of different use cases. And we'll talk a little bit um, later about some ideas about how to make it more reliable. Um, on the same topic, you know, I think the, the sort of question beneath the surface here is, is it possible to evaluate language models automatically, or do we need humans? Like, are humans still important in this process? If we could automatically evaluate language models, it would be really powerful, because automatic evaluation unlocks parallel experimentation, right? So if we can automatically make a change and see if that change improves performance, then what that means is we could try 50 changes at once, 100 changes at once, and pick out the one that actually improves things, which is very different than how prompt engineering works for most people today, where you sort of make changes in serial um, and then evaluate things sort of carefully in between each change. Unfortunately, you probably do need, still need some manual checks. So I think the, the way you should think about the goal of automatic evaluation in the process of building LLM-powered apps is that um, it's something that should, be, um, should help you as a developer uh, make changes faster and um, validate those changes faster. 
Um, and it should also help you use humans more efficiently in the evaluation process, but it shouldn't replace humans as the final arbiter of whether this thing is, whether we're comfortable putting this thing in front of our end users. Um, so you probably still wanna gather some feedback from users, um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so I was alluding to this before, but there are some really big limitations to evaluating language models with other language models. Um, in particular, there's all kinds of biases in language model generated evaluations that people have found in the research world. So uh, LLMs tend to, you know, if you ask them to rate something on a scale of one to five, they often have like a favorite number that they'll pick more than other things, um, as do people, uh, but language models do too. Language models tend to prefer their own outputs. So if you ask GPT-4 to compare, you know, Claude and GPT-4, it's gonna be a little bit biased towards GPT-4. Um, again, maybe pretty similar to people. The order of the candidate responses matters. So if you ask a model to compare two responses, um, different models have different biases here, but most models will tend to be biased towards the second answer or the first answer. And they, often, they also tend to prefer things like longer responses, right? So the, the question that this probably raises is, if we're gonna rely on language models for evaluating other language models, then who's watching the watchman, right? How do we make sure that our evaluations are themselves reliable? Um, so I think the way forward here is human verified language model evaluation. So I, as a developer, have an auto eval system that I can interact with in a tight feedback loop to make quick changes, maybe even parallel changes, and have at least some reasonable sense that the change that I made is good or has a high likelihood of being good. Um, and then on the other side of that, we have high quality human evaluation. Um, this is the human evaluation that's gonna be expensive. Um, you're not gonna wanna run it on every single um, sort of uh, change that you make to your prompt. And the reason why it's expensive is because uh, GPT-4 is, uh, although it's limited as an evaluator, it's actually more accurate than um, people that you hire randomly on um, Mechanical Turk. Uh, so you need high quality evaluations to validate whether your automatic evaluation is doing the right thing or not. So I wanna go a little bit deeper on this question of human evaluation, um, because human evaluation for language models is also not a silver bullet. Uh, it's, it's not just saying, you know, let's use humans to evaluate, doesn't solve the problem of um, of verifying whether the, the, these things are reliable or not. Um, and so to kind of see why, we'll talk about some of the common forms of human evaluation. So probably the most common thing you'll see is uh, Likert scales or Likert-like scales. All this means is you ask people to rate something on a scale of one to five or something like that. And um, the problem with this is just like LLMs when they're asked to do this, people are very inconsistent. Um, you might imagine that there's inconsistencies between people like, I might have a different, you know, meaning for uh, neutral than any of you do. But also people, unfortunately, are internally not self-consistent either. So even the same person, if you ask them to rate the same thing uh, over, like, some, an hour apart or something, they might give a, a different answer. Uh, so this is, this is a, a pretty problematic way of doing human evaluation, but it's still very common. In order to deal with this, a lot of, like, if you read the sort of reinforcement learning from human feedback literature, um, a, lot of these, a lot of these types of approaches have moved away from asking people to rate things on a scale of one to five, and instead asking people for their preference. Do you prefer answer A or do you prefer answer B? If you've ever wondered why, like why is it that um, we, do, we use preference data for RLHF instead of you know, um, thumbs up, thumbs down, or uh, one to five, it's because of this, um, which is that um, people are more reliable at rating their preferences between things than they are at giving two answers a score from one to five. Unfortunately though, um, when you ask people for preferences, they're also not doing what you would hope that they're doing, which is like thinking really carefully about the answer to the question, considering all of the, the factors that you might care about and giving a score. Um, most of the time when you ask people to give a preference between different answers, they look at surface level attributes of the answers, like the writing style and things like that, not the factual consistency. Um, so there's a really interesting paper from Berkeley that came out a couple weeks ago that showed that a lot of the, um, the sort of you know, human evaluations that people are um, kind of publishing in research literature uh, hide large problems with the model outputs where the models are saying some stuff that's like totally incorrect, but people just like the way it writes the things. And so they're still like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so um, uh, human raters focus on style, not factuality. I think this is just a, a, a figure from that paper. A, like if you kind of talk to the folks that are researching human evaluation, 
A lot of times what they'll point to as a better way forward is fine-grained evaluation, where instead of asking people just to rate this whole paragraph of text, you um, point to specific attributes of the text that you want them to measure, and then you ask them to like click on specific passages or sentences in the text that are, are supporting evidence for this point. And so there's you know, some evidence in the research that this might be a more reliable way for people to rate um, LLM outputs. But to kind of sum this up, um, there's also big limitations for human evaluation. So the first is quality. Um, unfortunately, GPT-4 writes better evaluations than most people on MTurk. Um, but, and, like, and without careful experiment design, human evaluators are probably not actually gonna measure th the thing that you really care about. They're not gonna measure the, the real quality of your outputs. Uh, quality, human eval is also super expensive, and you know, we, who has time to wait for it, right? Like, I'm, I certainly don't wanna have to you know, take a day to wait for my human raters to get back to me on something it, just because I changed one word in my prompt. So the way forward is, in my opinion, human verified LLM eval, where you um, set up really high quality human evaluations that are gonna be expensive, um, primarily as a mechanism for validating your auto-evaluator. Um, if you trust your auto-evaluator, then you can use it in a tight feedback loop as part of your development process um, to make changes more confidently. Okay, um, last thing I wanna say on, on this is sort of just to sum this up in kind of a process um, that we talked through. And um, the process, I think, is like a more systematic way of building applications on top of language models that puts testing for, like, um, front and center. So the process is this. You start by deploying an initial version of your application to some small subset of your users. That subset might be, you know, your friends, your colleagues, um, some people that you trust not to, you know, get, uh, get mad at you if the model doesn't work as, as it's expected to. You capture feedback from those humans. You use that feedback for two things. First, you use it to build a better evaluation set. So you have a better and better, you know, set of data to use to tell whether the new model is, is good or not. And second, to you know, find opportunities to improve your model or improve your prompt. So you use it to iterate and you use it to expand the coverage of your evaluation set. When you make changes, you evaluate these things um, first using an automated evaluation method, and then um, eventually, when, you're, when you feel confident that this thing is probably ready to go to production, you put it through an approval process. That approval process might be where you have your, you know, your expensive human-based evaluation process. And then lastly, you deploy this um, to a larger set of users and start this, this virtuous cycle over again, gathering more and more feedback from a broader set of people to use to make your models and your prompts better and um, make your evaluations better as well. Okay, um, last thing I wanna say, I didn't really wanna make this like too much of a, of a pitch for Gantry because I'm just like super excited about the um, research side of evaluations right now, but a little bit about us. Um, I'm co-founder and CEO. Uh, Former research scientist um, at OpenAI, uh, did my PhD at Berkeley. Um, my co-founder, Vicky, and I worked together at OpenAI in the early days. She built like all the infrastructure there. Um, we're backed by some awesome investors. And the problem that we're solving is um, really creating a more systematic process for teams to iterate on machine learning powered products after they're deployed. Um, and these products are powered by language models and all other types of machine learning models as well. We've got customers doing like recommender systems, LLM based stuff. Um, and so this is kind of why evaluations have been top of mind for me recently, because for a lot of our LLM customers, um, this is sort of the long pole in the tent, right? If you can't tell whether models are actually good, whether they're actually solving problems for your users, it's gonna be really hard for you to sort of confidently make changes to them in production.